in two years in person. Uh, so uh, we will have more events coming up soon, and uh, we will try to make all of them hybrid and soon transition out to all in-person events. Uh, we do have uh, people joining us today virtually as well, so we want to start on time. So uh, just to uh, start over here, AJK, over to you, and then we can start. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Welcome, Welcome everybody. everybody. Um, I think, I think yes, as you, we have board, board members, members here and card members, 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 so so I think, think as Neha pointed point out, out, today is going to be our hybrid, hybrid event. event. And, and uh, the, the, the after coming in, like being away for close to one and a half years, and seeing all of the members and everything last. About, about a year, year about a little over a year, year ago, ago, I think BJ, the past president, and myself, um, we, we did, did a session with uh, uh, the CARES Act, Act to uh, very, very well received, lots, lots of good questions, and, and thanks for uh, spending, spending time, time with us again. again. And, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, today, uh, um, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very important, important for all of us in the technology industry to know about this bill, which is to talk about how, you know, the technology, the technology investments in our country, country can improve and, and you know, differentiate us compared to the rest of the world. Of the world. So, we'll so we'll talk, talk more about, about that. that. Yogi, please uh, uh, make an introduction, introduction and take it from there. Wonderful, AJK. Thank you. And for all of you here today in person, we appreciate you being here today on Thai's first hybrid event after COVID. But it's simply my privilege and my pleasure to uh, introduce somebody that I think needs very little introduction, but certainly okay. Congressman Khanna represents the commercial business that we teach. So, so I, I think, think you, you know, know uh, uh, as, as a start, start right, right uh, maybe, maybe uh, uh, you, know, you, should you should tell us a little bit about the bill itself, itself and how it was conceived, and then we have a bunch of questions that you want to make it interactive. That's, that's the flow of the event. event. Is that a uh, right way to start, Yogi? Yeah, yeah. please go ahead. Yeah. Well, like okay, uh, this is a bill that Senator Schumer and I have been working on for three years, bipartisan bill, Endless Frontiers, with uh, Senator Todd Young in Indiana and Representative Mike Gallagher over in Wisconsin. It passed the Senate 68 to 32. McConnell voted for it. That's how bipartisan it was. Uh, and it, it's poised to pass the House of Representatives. When it does, it will mark the largest increase in science and technology investment since the 1960s in our country. Uh, a uh, investment of uh, over $100 billion over five years in critical industries of the future, uh, in synthetic biology, uh, alternative proteins, electronic manufacturing, semiconductors, uh, quantum computing, uh, AI, clean technology, creating technology hubs across America, so not just at Stanford and MIT, uh, but across America. And of course, it's uh, the, the America spends about 0.7 percent of our GDP on research and development. At the height of the Cold War, it was 2 percent. China is at 1.3 percent. So we need to make a fundamental investment. It was the uh, federal, federal research and development that, of course, everyone knows in the Valley that led to the creation of the internet. The IP protocols and the TCP protocols that Vince Cerf came up with was uh, during the time that he was at DARPA, funded by DARPA. 
and that what really led to the creation of both the IP address and the TCP transmission that uh, allowed for data packets to go from one computer to the other because of the use uh, that that would have. And if it weren't for BitSurf and if it weren't for uh, the federal funding of that, we never would have had uh, the internet. So we have seen the uh, importance of research and science uh, technology. Of course, people in the Valley should uh, appreciate it uh, more uh, than anyone, and that this bill will make that bet on the industry. Thank, Thank you for, you for that, that good, good overview. overview. Sorry. We have a series of questions, and these questions are designed to help our audience listen to various aspects of this trailblazing bill as we define this as um, it is vital for America's uh, position in the world. But if you can talk a little bit about how, really, from your perspective, the strengthens entrepreneurship in the U.S., as you know, the Thai ecosystem thrives on the world of entrepreneurship. And this very idea of innovation, research, and development, and improving our supply chain capabilities. Can you shed a little bit of light on how that addresses that? Well, well one of the aspects of this bill is to create a tech director at the National Science Foundation. Punch, who's there, uh, I call him Punch, I don't know the full name, but he's a great uh, uh, a leader in American who was at Arizona State University uh, and committed to applied science. This is actually a, a, a belief in funding not just theoretical science, but applied science. My view, what I've told folks who push back and said, oh, you should just do theoretical science, is I said, you, to, to make advances in theoretical science, you need applied science. So theoretical scientist, when he comes up with a theorem, when he comes up with an idea, has to see how that works in practice to then revise that theorem to perfect that theory. Uh, and I sort of sometimes sarcastically say, well, okay, maybe that doesn't apply for Albert Einstein. But if you're Albert Einstein, you also don't need an NSF grant. You're going to be brilliant. The more most mortals who, uh, even people who win the Nobel Prize, they need uh, applied science to understand the theoretical science. And that's why the president of MIT, President Caltech, supported the bill. So the biggest thing he does on entrepreneurship is it says we believe that the private sector uh, is, and, and entrepreneurs have a critical role to play in the advancement of science. That we have to have collaboration from the outset between our academic institutions, between our private entrepreneurs, uh, and between uh, the uh, significant leaders of industry and government to create the scientific breakthroughs that we need. And, and uh, you know, on that uh, front, right, uh, you know, um, the value, if you really take a look at it, is the hardware for the semiconductor industry, AI, quantum computing, and attraction. Um, how, how does it assist, assist that, that these particular segments, which are you know, many of the Thai entrepreneurs, Thai entrepreneurs have got businesses in these areas, and, and of course, you know, a lot of us, I for one, got a lot of my entrepreneurial journey from the semiconductor industry, and there's a talk about the revival of the semiconductor industry, considering the amount of investment going in, and then also trying to fill a gap between the rest of the world and America. Well, the semiconductor industry would have a significant funding, almost $50 billion, to be able to create hubs and fabs in the United States. I mean, right now, the leading uh, semiconductor manufacturer is in Taiwan, the Taiwan Semiconductor uh, Manufacturing Company. And they're, they are uh, a leading in terms of non-proprietary manufacturing, because the Intel, of course, is proprietary. They only manufacture their own chips. But when it comes to having a, uh, a manufacturer of uh, general chips, it's all being done in Taiwan. And so they're coming to Arizona, and this funding would actually help make that possible so that that doesn't just become a prototype uh, or a small manufacturing facility, but actually becomes a broader manufacturing facility. It will help other uh, semiconductors, manufacturers to set up manufacturing plants here uh, to make sure that their manufacturing is done in the United States so we're not dependent on critical chips. Uh, from Taiwan or from a, uh, a Korea or another uh, part of the world. That, that, that we need to have that critical capacity here. And the CHIPS funding is all about uh, uh, providing uh, funding for semiconductors to set up their manufacturing. Is it predominantly only in the manufacturing or also front and all the way from the design? Model? All the way in the design and manufacturing, but a significant focus on making sure that the manufacturing is here, that we're not splitting and just doing the design. I mean, some of the design we still are leading I mean, in, in design, as you know. And, and uh, Taiwan hasn't even caught up on some of the uh, some of the most advanced design. But that's of little uh, or not sufficient value if we're not also manufacturing it here. 
So it is an integrated focus on design and manufacturing, but a real focus on making sure that those chips can be manufactured in the United States. So the AI front is going to fundamentally fund research. Uh, you know, one of the things that China has a big advantage is on big data. But as a professor at MIT explained to me, uh, you know, I have kids, so when a kid, child learns a new word, they don't have uh, thousands of input. You don't have to look to see thousands of pictures of a fish to learn the word fish. The human brain is far more complex. And the leading edge research on AI is to try to model the human brain and how we actually comprehend the world uh, instead of just thinking we're going to uh, put tons of data into something and discern a pattern. And that kind of AI research would be transformative. And as one of the professors at MIT told me, is trying to engineer Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant being the famous philosopher who came up with time, space, and the categories of human perception. So uh, the bill will fundamentally fund uh, research in AI that is transformative, that isn't happening right now in the private sector. Private sector funding on AI outstrips China 8 to 1 in the United States. Uh, but that funding isn't going into the most transformative aspects of AI, and that's what we would be funding in this, uh, in this bill. And then on quantum computing, uh, it will be funding uh, both the uh, technology of quantum computing and then thinking about how do we uh, have uh, cybersecurity, because if quantum computing can break through encryption or break through uh, uh, security, we're going to have to also think about how do we have security in the name of quantum computing. That's great. Congressman, a lot of times the investment by the government has complemented the private investments, and specifically the Thai ecosystem and Silicon Valley, uh, thriving on the venture capitalism. Um, this is a long haul bill. It's not immediate, one year, two years, so for a track of time. <coughs> what input, what thoughts would you give to the venture community? How can they complement and support the basic intent? of the new frontier bill? Well, the, the, the bill, I think, endless frontier will lay out the critical areas of uh, technology that uh, will be funded. So that, that will be finalized in the other areas. And, and of course, uh, you know, venture capitalists will know more than I do what the uh, what has market promise. But I would say that places that were focused as critical needs for the country will probably be uh, places that uh, are uh, uh, or, or would, would benefit from uh, collaboration with the private sector and with, uh, with the government. And I would say that, uh, uh, you know, I would never give someone investment advice, and that's not my place. But what I will say is that uh, we have to look to have collaboration in critical industries. Yeah, and I think on that front, right, I mean, there's a lot of collaboration that happens between industry and um, the, the academics, right? Um, there's a different type of funding like SBIR, SDPI, um, and um, uh, ROM grants, all that kind of stuff. Is, that, is the board going to be similar to what has been historically done? I don't know how NSF and other DARPA and all of them fund this, or is it uh, changing in terms of how this money is going to be deployed to these channels? Well, I think it's going to be a similar deploy channel, but with a tech director, which is going to focus on what is the collaboration when you're applying for this grant, what are you doing to collaborate with the private sector? What are you doing in terms of job creation? What is your plan for commercialization? So the criteria is going to be uh, with a greater lens of the applied aspect of the technologies. But the process, a lot of the disbursement will still be through the NSF, uh, which has gotten the biggest plus up, or the labs, or the DOE. Uh, that is still going to be the same process with a greater focus on applied. You mentioned quite a bit about MIT and, and some of the professors who've been uh, part of the framework of the early conversations. Can you elaborate a little bit about um, the very notion of academic versus uh, industry collaboration? And if you can further augment this a little bit about, obviously we look at things through a Silicon Valley cluster, but the rural versus the urban technology cluster beyond Silicon Valley. Would you speak to that a little bit? Well, one of the exciting things about this bill is it's going to take technology hubs across the country. Uh, you know. Uh, the market cap, can anyone guess what the market cap of Bay Area companies are? Any guess? And for you. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I just added Google and Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> 11 trillion dollars. 11 trillion dollars. Unprecedented in, in economic history. Uh, and yet, uh, towns under 50,000 have had wealth stagnation since 2008, it's stagnant wages. The racial wealth gap has actually increased in this country since uh, the end of Jim Crow. Think about that, since uh, Dr. King and the end of 
the uh, formalized segregation racial wealth gap uh, has increased in um, American society. So you have large parts of the country left out of the digitization of the economy, 25 million digital jobs by 2025, more than manufacturing and construction combined, and yet those jobs are highly concentrated in places like the Bay Area, Austin, Boston, Seattle, New York. We have to change that as a society, as a country, if we want to have people participate in the economic wealth generation of the future. And this bill does that by saying that not all the money can go just to MIT and Stanford. Uh, it has to create technology hubs across the country uh, in creating those opportunities for wealth generation. So what kind of guidelines are there? I mean, you know, when you're creating the clusters, is it NSF that's giving the guideline, or uh, no. the directorate, or it, is it it's the actually you know, uh, of, you know uh, congressmen who go and ask them on how does it work? No, certainly not Congress. That would be, uh, <laughs> you'd just be giving it to uh, too much patronage. So it is uh, the Department of Commerce that would have guidelines with the Secretary of Commerce, and you would have a community clients. Think of the Amazon process. But think of it not with uh, uh, competing with public subsidies, but competing to, to get to show that you have an innovative community that's going to uh, be able to uh, get a grant. So you have to get the private sector, you have to get the universities, the community college system, the school districts, all to submit this application. And then there would be an independent panel at Commerce that say, this is a uh, community that really would thrive for a uh, innovation a tech grant. And it may not be in software, it may be in uh, regenerative agriculture, it may be in uh, some advanced form of manufacturing, it may be in robotics, but your community would show uh, that need and then the Department of Commerce would make that decision. Okay. Which brings to the next point, certainly the investments in education. From a skilling standpoint, um, how does this bill invest the very idea of educating the workforce of the future, specific to some of the things that we certainly have lacked in, in America in regards to education and retooling the workforce of the future? Well, its focus is on credentialing, so that uh, we need to not just have people learn uh, academic skills, but what are the actual skills that are going to get them employed and the credential that's going to get employed. So it's collaborative with the private sector and community colleges and universities to say, okay, what is the one-year training program uh, that's actually going to get someone an employable skill and with market needs? And it's also working with the school districts to get that kind of uh, a collaborative education because a lot of times you hear that people take these courses and then they end up frustrated because they're not able to be employable. They don't know how to, uh, the, uh, some of the basic commercial technology or applications. They don't know, for example, I mean, training someone in uh, Amazon uh, a Cloud or in, in, in Google Cloud or in, in, in understanding that is probably a very effective way to get a job or in robotics process automation. So working with the pro private sector, what are the skills uh, that are going to lead uh, to job creation, and how do we get those uh, people with those skills? Yeah, I mean, uh, in, along the same line, right, the skilling, you know, the, uh, the universities play a major role, and as you know, um, American universities attract a lot of students worldwide, right, and when they come here, uh, they go to, uh, you know, their education, it could be a combination of research and just uh, you know, classes they go to you know, in a classroom setting. But end of the day, when they come out, they need to get a practical uh, on-the-job training, right? So there's some there are pro uh, things like campus practical training, CPT, OPT, and then of course subsequently H1B and all that stuff. There's multiple ways of uh, you know getting them into the market. These students who come from abroad is that going to change, or I know I don't know how this connects with the uh, what I call employability of these international students. Which uh, you know, uh, many of our community, you know, <coughs> many of them come here to study and then yeah. create large companies. So, is well, it changing? Well, that that's an immigration question. I certainly think people who are coming here and creating jobs and have uh, have that expertise should have a way of getting a green card and, and it says a job. <coughs> still doesn't deal with the immigration that's issues. Uh, I mean, that's a huge separate issue. The bill is focused sort of on developing uh, American technology and innovation and training in the, the workforce here. Uh, of course, I, I, I do think that we need an immigration policy that says if you've gotten uh, educated in an American university and have a, a degree, an advanced degree, and you're working here, we'd rather have you stay here uh, than go back to the country and create jobs outside America. So uh, we want to incentivize 
uh, that we don't want to, we want to make sure there's no market leverage. So some of these companies that have abused the process by undercutting wages, uh, they haven't been, you know, Apple pays someone 120,000, but some of them pay 60,000. That needs to be stopped and that uh, needs to be reformed. Uh, but as long as they're paying market wages and not undercutting the market, the, the market then we have to uh, provide a way for, uh, for them to be creating jobs in the United States. Yeah, but, but these are various departments coming together, right? I know you talked about it's an immigration question, but the, the challenge that the industry faces many of the times is that, hey, I can't give an opportunity to somebody who researched uh, on a, you know, let's say, two nanometer semiconductor process and you know, NSF funded professor got that research done. Unfortunately, that person is not employable and packs the back and goes to some other parts of the world, right? And is there a way to uh, connect these, or it's uh, you know that's where the government has to come together, right? I mean, yeah, no, I think we need immigration uh, reform, but I think that the immigration reform is such a complicated issue that that deals with the border, what's happening there, that deals with what's happening with undocumented agriculture workers, hospitality workers. So the government, in solving that issue or addressing that issue, can't just look at one industry and say, okay, here's what we need uh, on technology without looking at it more comprehensively, given all of the constituencies involved. And I do think President Biden will have a comprehensive immigration plan. Uh, but right now, you know, this plan is sort of about uh, how do we invest in our uh, innovative, or development. So we may think, well, how do we make sure that we have more PhDs and more uh, advanced researchers in the United States cultivating our talent and our, our workforce? Congressman, thank you so much for that. Um, one of the key comp constituencies of the Thai ecosystem is entrepreneurs and founders of companies. Um, and often enough, we take pride in the fact that they solve problems that others don't see, and that's a long haul, and that's where they're able to build companies of value. On this bill, specifically, if the word entrepreneur would be looking at this bill, and understanding where the spirit of this law is to help um, America regain its supremacy in the world across the multiple amount of gamuts, what advice would you be giving to those entrepreneurs? Again, I don't want to give any business advice. I can't give any advice about investing or what to do for business. I can only talk about what I think right. is in the country's interest. Uh, but uh, I would say that what is a country we need to do uh, is focus uh, on uh, the fundamental infrastructure of technology. We need to make sure that we have 5G and we can uh, compete on 5G. We need to make sure that we are leading in AI. We need to make sure that we're leading in clean technology and uh, in looking at new places like fusion and the possibility of fusion, looking at uh, solar and wind and, and, and massive investments in that, looking at creating an electric vehicle, uh, charging uh, grids and, 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 and financing and transitioning to electric vehicles. We need to look, uh, think about where synthetic biology is headed and uh, be leading in synthetic biology, both because of the environmental impact and also the, the possibilities of production. So uh, my focus would be how do we increase the productive capacity and look for breakthrough technologies uh, in the country. And the government has to support the discontinuous innovation, the innovation that's transformative, that, uh, that the private sector often doesn't have the uh, long horizon patience or uh, ability to do because of the demands of quarterly uh, earnings and, 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 to, and stakeholders, shareholders. And, and, and again, uh, the, these type of uh, you know, forward-looking research, right, there are TRLs, you know, 0, 3, 4 to 7, 7 to 10, some of them are you know, forward-looking, right? So where do you think the money will be spent in that spread? Is it going to be even or is it going to be way forward-looking? Because, you know, uh, you talked about yeah. R&D investments, right? People are looking at hey, what will I get in the next one year versus uh, five years versus 10 years. So how do Well, we that's a place where, uh, fortunately, Congress people aren't going to be making the decisions. I don't think uh, you want members of Congress deciding what, how the money should be spent in, in that, that level of specificity. You want the experts and, in, and, and academics and industry leaders. So that would be a decision that punch at the NSF or... Uh, that DOEs had or the uh, labs would, would have. And Congress is just saying, we want this continuous innovation. We want them in these broad areas. Uh, but the specificity of it is not something you want from members of Congress because uh, you know, the brilliant members of Congress who understand uh, technology, if we were to start, start to prescribe that, I don't, I don't think that would be healthy for the, for the country. 
Yeah, for the audience, we just wanted to make sure that keep uh, have your questions. We have somebody who will read out the questions and we'll address it also. Uh, one uh, other question uh, along the same line is that, you know, the technology clusters, you know, the Silicon Valley and also around the country, right? Uh, we talked about it earlier, but specifically, um, you know, how will the technology clusters benefit or, you know, you know this building is going to help that community? How will it benefit the technology clusters? Yeah. Well, it would be a direct grants that the Commerce Department could provide two, three billion dollars of the grants to communities. Let's say you're, I'm just picking something at random. Let's say you're St. Louis, Missouri, and you say, I want to create a technology cluster, and you have the capacity. Mm -hmm. Well, let's pick Akron, because Akron had tire manufacturing. And you did something that built on the skills of tires, but in an advanced manufacturing or robotics or something that built on that skill set, and you said, I want to create that technology up. You would apply to the Department of Commerce and you would have, we need money uh, to do this training, we need this money to build out a, a labs, we need this money to hire faculty, we need this money to f have venture capital funding, uh, we need this money to uh, support local entrepreneurs and the Department of Commerce would literally write a grant check, which then would be administered. Now I think the venture capital should be administered not by the government, but by local venture capitalists probably in that area uh, who aren't conflicted, and we have to figure out how do we uh, make sure that the, there's collaboration again between government, private sector, and the uh, in, in the academy. And th th this is not some naive hope that you can create Silicon Valley everywhere. You, pr you probably can't. The efforts that have done that have failed. Uh, so no one is saying go create two trillion dollar market caps in, in companies. But what we're saying is that every place can make have their own innovative possibilities and that you can create more innovation clusters. It could be around timber processing, it could be around agriculture, it could be around, around manufacturing. Technology is, is digitizing every industry and having transformative effects. And this is seeking to look at how do we create, uh, tailored to the community, uh, the possibility of uh, more innovation uh, within the community. Great. And one of the uh, press uh, clippings on this issue, I talked a little about how the bill strengthens our position um, against China's domination in the world. How do you speak to that? Because that's a question many people ask. Um, how will this impact companies who are going to be operating in China? Well, first of all, I, I, I would bet on the United States system as an immigrant nation, as a free enterprise nation, as a democracy over China any day. Uh, I, I, I'm not underestimating it, but I say the day I will get concerned about China, uh, deeply concerned, is when we start to see everyone in the world wanting to go to China. Right now, that's not happening. They still want to come to the United States. And the reason they want to come to the United States is that it's still a great place to, uh, to live. It's a place where you can uh, to, to, to have enormous freedom and not enormous uh, innovation potential, enormous creativity, enormous ability to, to, to live your own values, your own traditions, your own culture. Now, what we need to do, though, is make sure that the bedrock is strong, that we can't have uh, an authoritarian country uh, simply spend uh, orders of magnitude more in, in uh, critical areas like 5G, like AI, like synthetic biology, and start developing leads in that, and then exporting that to a form, in my view, of almost neo-colonialism, where they're going into these other countries and telling them that, okay, we're going to give you the technology and making them dependent on those technologies. And those technologies don't have uh, privacy, they don't have the same freedoms, and so we don't want those to become uh, the standards for the world, and we also don't want uh, a, a, another nation to, to lead in those areas. And to make, to make sure we don't give, give them that lead, we want to be investing here uh, in the United States. Uh, I don't believe we need to have another Cold War with China, but I, I believe America should win. I think America should lead. And the way to do that is uh, by investing in our critical innovation. If we make those investments combined with our university, they you know, the top 20 universities in the world in the United States, combined with our system of free enterprise, combined with our entrepreneurship, I have no doubt that uh, America will lead the 21st century. Well, that's the last question we now come down to. We're really getting back to this very notion that you have to come back and summarize your thoughts about how this helps us um, lead towards the question of the kind of advantage in the world. Um, how would you summarize that? Well, it helps us I mean, think about what we did. We created the internet for the world. And that was through a federal investment. It was literally through DARPA. 
Uh, and uh, we created GPS, we uh, created uh, so many of the transformative technologies. There's no reason to think that we wouldn't be able to do that in numerous other fields, especially now when we've got more diversity than ever before, more talent from around the world than ever before. Uh, we can be on the cutting edge of driving these, the, the fundamental innovation for the 21st century. I do believe that the nation that leads technologically in the 21st century is a nation that will lead the 21st century. I don't think it, winning the 21st century is simply about building new uh, traditional military power. Of course, you have to have a strong enough defense to be safe and to make sure no one invades Taiwan and no one is taking over islands. Uh, of course, you need to have deterrence. But that's just putting ICBMs in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in uh, encircling China is not going to win the 21st century. Leading in AI, leading in clean technology, leading in quantum computing, that's what's going to win the 21st century. Yeah, we have uh, some questions from the audience. I so think. We have about three questions so far. The first question is from Prakash Naran, who is uh, chair of our mentor credit program for many years at Tycon. He's asking, are there tax incentives in the bill for retaining manufacturing in the U.S.? There are not in this bill, but there are in the infrastructure bill that we will be uh, hopefully passing with uh, President Biden, and that is tax incentives designed towards manufacturing in the United States. Of course, the chips part of this, the semiconductor, there are direct grants and direct loans to manufacture in the United States. But in terms of broader tax incentives, that's something that will be part of the infrastructure bill, uh, both uh, in terms of government procurement, saying if you're manufacturing in the United States, the government will be more likely to buy, and tax incentives for solar, for wind, for other manufacturing in the United States. So that's uh, hopefully going to be part of the invest act, the, the infrastructure bill that we will pass. I'll take the second question is from Ritu, who represents the Indica News. You have been an advocate for promoting manufacturing in the U.S. And the, her question is, what percentage of $100 billion, if she's correct, would go in manufacturing and how much in research into AI, etc.? Well, I think they're interlinked. I don't think, I mean, again, the breakout isn't, that's for the NSF and DOE and uh, others to decide. But the fundamental uh, view is that it will go in towards it critical innovation, and those innovations, some of it will be applied that leads to production and manufacturing, some of it will be theoretical, but it will be much more applied than currently. Currently, there's heavy skew to simply the theoretical, and what this is doing by creating a tech directory is saying, no, we have to pay attention to the commercialization and uh, practical applications as well, especially given that U.S. tax dollars are, are paying for it, that they're uh, one, it's better for science, but two, uh, uh, the American taxpayer deserves some accounting of, uh, of, of the value. You can't just have scientists writing in scientific journals for other scientists seeking their own reputation. That's good, but there has to be some focus on what is society gain from this. Okay. And the third, qu third question is uh, from Sean. Owen Visa can support both immigration and innovation. What are the plans to attract top innovators across the globe to U.S.? Canada has overtaken U.S. and North America in the recent years. Any plans to change that landscape? Talking about the open visa support for both immigration and innovation. Well, I, I don't believe that Canada has overtaken the U.S. Can anyone name a successful Canadian company? <laughs> Some of this is, uh, I mean, uh, it's overwrought that it's a country of 30 million people, give me a break or something. It's a nice country, it's a polite country, but, you know, it, when Canada produces Apple or Google or et cetera, then we can talk. I mean, we're, we're an extraordinary powerhouse, sometimes we underestimate that. How many people here want to move to Canada? I mean, I, so a lot of Canadians want to come to the United States. So. Uh, all of that is to say, look, America is a magnet for people around the world. It still is. Even after Donald Trump, we're still a magnet for people around the world. But what we have to do is, uh, I think, embrace a, a vision of pluralism, uh, a, a, of tolerance and respect to so continue to be there, to invest in our education, to invest in uh, our, uh, our, 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 our sense of uh, health care so that we aren't being burdened by health care to make sure that we're supporting a, a practical education of our population. And if we do all those things, I think we're still an incredibly strong country. I mean, it's true that some of the jobs obviously have gone uh, overseas, and we ought to be competing on that and not be complacent. 
Uh, but we also not, shouldn't overstate the case. Can, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question. You talk about the relationship between NSF um, and, uh, and uh, you know, we also talk about Arapala, uh, which is also doing a lot of research grants. And then, and then, of course, course the Department, Department of Commerce. So how are these three departments connected? And uh, uh, I, for one, one not very really clear. Because yeah, I, I, as, as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, I received uh, uh, grants from uh, DOE, for, for example. example. Right. And, and there was a direct, direct relationship between our company and yeah. DOE. And we and we partnered with the University of Illinois and Illinois Champagne. But, but how are these, these uh, uh, you know, uh, how is this triangle, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. It's three, three different, different uh, uh, it's departments. It's a good point. That's right. probably there's some better federal integration of exactly. exactly. these scientific communities. And that's something that Eric Lander, who's the head of the Office of Science and Technology and Policy, is working on. How do you have kind of a one-stop, coordinated uh, uh, service? But right now, they're pretty distinct. You have NSF that has its own grant process, NIH that has its own grant process, EOE that has its own grant process, the labs that have their own, the ARPA that has its own. Uh, it, it's not all holistic. Now, some things you don't want holistic, just like you have many different VCs, and yeah. that creates a diversity of perspective. But having greater coordination is something that the Biden administration is working on. But right now, it's distinct. Oh, but, 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 uh, uh, but, but each, each department, department the, 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 the overall uh, money available in this uh, bill will go to each of these departments? Know, like, it, yeah, the bill specifies how much. So NSF is getting the largest plus up. Some of it's going to the labs. Some of it's going to the DOE. Some of it's going to Congress. It's split. Oh, okay. 100 billion is the average. This is not the uh, DARPA. <coughs> this, this is not the DARPA. DARPA gets funded through a different uh, uh, source through the Armed Services Bill. And DARPA is about 3.5 <coughs> billion. They'll get some plus up through the arms, uh, through the National Defense Authorization. Okay. And this is 100 billion spread over what, five, five years. Five years. So, so five years. Five years. That's, that's, that's 100 billion of new money. New yeah. Money. yeah. And, and so, so timing, timing of it, right? I mean, uh, the, the question that uh, I had is that you know, uh, Senate just passed it, and then you know, House is still working on it. So, so will, will it be back this budget, budget year? Because it starts in October, October right? Or, or I don't know if it's uh, too, too soon to. We're, yeah. we're, we're hopeful it'll pass by uh, by October, but I think by the end of the year we're, we're hopeful. Of it. I mean, confident it'll pass by the end of the year. So, so realistically, for uh, U.S. system, system, system and the research, research community to get money, is that, that going to be the budget year starting April first, or it'll be October now or October next year? For this money to ultimately impact. I think it, realistically, it's 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 probably into next year. I mean, I don't know. That'll be a decision that, of course, the administrators will make how how fast they can get it distributed, how much applications it'll be, how much the when they'll be able to set the criteria. But you're probably looking at something in 2022. Uh, That's right. In a few minutes, and I know there's yeah, yeah, questions. questions. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Sure. Well, thank you, Congressman. First of all, congratulations on getting this bill through Senate, which is harder typically. Uh, and I'm really disappointed to see the states, which really need this fund to come up, and yeah. the one who voted against it, uh, for all the uh, political reasons, I suppose, right? Um, but my question is that I have been academic, I've been tenure professor, wow. I've been in industry, I was in Florida. Yeah. Um, and I still teach at NYU, yeah. uh, just for the interest um, in innovation and technology management program. Uh, I've also been in, in um, industry. I lead the global strategy consulting practice as well as aid the research and innovation in the law firm from Palo Alto. Now, what I have found, being in the both side of the table, that there is another group which is in between. And I would directly say that Thai, for example. Right? We have a lot of interesting program in Thai, you know, and I'm co-chairing Thai University program where we are looking at how we can get university students to become entrepreneur, right. and how we can create a program for them. Now, universities will get grants, industry will get grants. Is there a grant for Thai? <laughs> 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 well, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a thoughtful question. I mean, what you're saying is that there's a civic space that has to be uh, looked at, and that uh, it's not just the uh, private sector and the government and the academic, but that we how do we cultivate that civic sector 
uh, as well, that has social capital, that has networks, that uh, influences uh, aspiration and influences mentoring. Uh, uh, and I certainly think that there is a role uh, for the civic space. I suppose in this bill, uh, the way that would happen is if a community in, let's say, uh, you know, let's say San Jose, of course, would probably not qualify because it's already flourishing, but let's say there was a, a community that was on the border edge and applied uh, for funding. And they said, you know, as part of this, we want to have some of the funding go to a group like Thai or Thai in that community because they are going to do X, Y, and Z. Then they could get funding as part of the Commerce Grant. Uh, it doesn't bar funding of uh, civic nonprofit organizations. More broadly, of course, uh, you know, I, I, I support uh, uh, the, the Congress funding uh, civic organizations and uh, that, that promote entrepreneurship and, and, and there should be avenues to, to do that. We, for the district we put uh, funding for several programs, digital programs in the districts, infrastructure programs and uh, if an organization like Thai had a strong program in our district that had the buy-in of a lot of local elected officials and uh, local community leaders then that could be another avenue for how about Thai connecting with some universities? Is there a way to get funding through that route also? Yeah, I mean, if the university, uh, the university put for the request for funding, uh, they could say we want to allocate some of that funding for 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 Thai. I mean, that that, that is something uh, that could also could also be done. Yeah, on uh, that front, uh, also, right, as you know. Uh, Thai Silicon Valley is the founding chapter for the you know, overall yeah. Thai organization. We How big is it now? We uh, have 61 60 chapters around the world, uh, 61, 61 chapters, but there are many, many chapters within the United States. In fact, uh, Thai Global, which kind of manages all the relationship across all the chapters, uh, we've hired somebody um, you know, specifically looking at these kind of grant opportunities yeah. and partner with uh, uh, other kind of research uh, innovation ecosystems in a way, right? So, so is there a, a something that we could work uh, with your offices, or we should go to the respective regions uh, for looking at across America? So the reason I'm saying is that yeah. I mean, we talked about innovation hubs, right? So we have Thai in Boston, Seattle, Portland, Arizona, um, in Colorado, Florida, you name it. There are lots of places Thai is offices are there, and each one of them, as you know, is a is its own 501c6 organization. Right. That's how we've set it up. We're all non-profit. So the question is, how do we, you know, should we work to your offices or should we go to the regional uh, elected officials and talk about this opportunity? What should they both? I would say both. I mean, obviously our office can be uh, helpful in, in seeing what are the opportunities and uh, what are the potential grants and what are the opportunities through the appropriations process. And then it, it never hurts that 435 members of Congress, the more members of Congress and more senators that are advocating something, the easier it makes it. So certainly I think you should do it regionally, especially if there's a region that's applying to become a technology hub. And Thai can be helpful in that process of, how, of helping them think through what that plan should look like to succeed. And then that process can be part of that, that solution. So I, I would advocate, uh, I would say both approaches. Yeah, I see Andy, who's part of our, uh, you know, part of the sponsors, but he's also on our board. Uh, how are, you know, I know Silicon Valley Bank is like a big, uh, you know, supporter of Thai also, right? But, you know, is there, um, like I know in this uh, PPE loan and all, maybe right. entrepreneurs work with the bank, is, you know, will Department of Commerce engage with any institutions like that for disbursement of uh, any grants and all that stuff? Or, or in Silicon Valley Bank? Or any other banks. <laughs> 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 I, I'm sure they would. I, obviously, they have to, 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 to engage with some banks, but I I don't know. I mean, that would be a de decision at, for the Secretary of Commerce. Oh, or really? how? You know, Congress. You know, we appropriate money, we provide guidelines, but then the the decisions on administration are appropriately left to the executive branch because you don't want that to be colored by political interests. So you want. You don't want some member of Congress saying, okay, I know this person at this bank, so work with them. So usually Congress does not prescribe the details, and it's the administration that appoints, you know, in this case, competent people to then come up with the administration of uh, 
of, of that. So it's not like Congress said to DARPA, you know, we're going to give you billions of dollars, go create the internet. Uh, it was that we're going to give you billions of dollars, and then DARPA had the ingenuity to hire Vince Cerf and say, go create the internet. Any other questions? Anybody else? We're almost approaching the tail end of our program right now, but we'll take a couple questions. Go ahead. So do that. Any, anything to help the youth get more into entrepreneurship to encourage them to get into entrepreneurship? It's a great question, and it's been one of the it's one of the big challenges. When you see look at the decline of uh, the, the communities in rural America, one of the biggest neg negatives has been the decline of entrepreneurship. So rural America actually was flourishing in the 90s was leading in terms of entrepreneurship, but for some reason you've had decline. Now there are a lot of reasons for that. It could be a lack of access to capital, it could be uh, a lack of uh, appropriate access to technology, uh, a, a lack of uh, enough networks, uh, but we, we have to figure out uh, how do we expand uh, entrepreneurship across this country. And uh, I think that that uh, tie can play a big role in that. Uh, I think it has to be about dispersion of capital, dispersion of technology, dispersion of opportunity. Uh, but other ideas that you have about that would be would be welcome because definitely uh, entrepreneurship has to be a critical part of the uh, wealth generation for a community. Otherwise, what you will have is you know you could have the 25 million jobs all over the place, but without the entrepreneurship, the wealth would all be sucked up by the places where all the companies and entrepreneurs are. And I don't think that's, that's not what the American people want. They don't want uh, all the wealth just to go to a few places and then they all work for uh, a few regions. They, they want wealth to be generated locally. Yeah. What is the next big bill that you're looking at? <laughs> well, first I gotta, you know, uh, you know, Bill Clinton once said that politics is like tennis. If you think about winning the set, you'll lose the point at hand. So we're at the first set. Uh, uh, get the bill across uh, the, the finish line. But we're, we're looking at a number of other uh, bills after this. Uh, we, we are working with Joe Manchin uh, on a bill to say, how can we make land-grant universities, Ohio State, Michigan uh, State, uh, ones where you had the ag extensions, uh, where these land-grant universities prepare mm -hmm. people for the mechanical arts and agriculture. How can we prepare them for the digital economy? to have these uh, universities already partner with the private sector to prepare people for uh, the future. I've thought about a, a bill on creating a national digital core, like we have a Peace Corps, uh, like we have uh, people who do different things. What if we had all of these star talents <coughs> from six months to a year in a community to help them build their digital capacity, which would have the benefit of these communities learning uh, to set up these programs and would have the benefits for companies to uh, understand other markets better, other communities and cultures better. Uh, and then we've had a bill on federal financing bank that would uh, have the federal government uh, provide purchase agreements or loans to set up new factories in, in, in electric vehicle manufacturing or big uh, undertakings uh, in communities where, uh, where new plants are possible. I think digital grant university is a great idea because there was a space grant university also, right? And yeah. So land grant, sea grant, those are the old ones, but space grant was, uh, so I think I would be very interested. <laughs> so the, uh, another question, I, I don't know if it's connected or not. Uh, I don't know how much time we have also, right? But let me ask you one other question. There's this category, I think it's called EB-5, right, Neha? Uh, so EB-5 is a kind of category where- Investor visa. Uh, investor uh, thing. Um, but see, that also uh, you know ties into creating jobs and uh, create you know developing entrepreneurship or developing entrepreneurs in general, right? Is there uh, any connection, or this is completely disjoint? And that's uh, well, that's again an immigration issue, and of course we want to encourage foreign direct investment of of, of all kinds. But with, with the immigration, of, of, uh, you know, the the, the the question of immigration. Is, is complex in the narrative, and I, I'll maybe end with this uh, note uh, uh, on two things. Uh, one, one of my favorite Oscar Wilde quotes is when Oscar Wilde comes to uh, New York and the customs asks him, uh, Mr. Wilde, what, were you, what do you have of value to declare? And Oscar Wilde says, nothing except my own genius. <laughs> and so, of course, this is a history of a country that has had people of deep, deep ambition 
uh, come to the United States and, and, and deep excellence despite uh, their backgrounds, and even if they don't have the traditional credentials or the traditional investment capability. Uh, but, you know, Mario Cuomo was a former governor of uh, New York. Uh, has this wonderful passage where he imagines a hypothetical conversation of his parents uh, coming to the United States and talking to the officer at Ellis Island and uh, the uh, officer saying to his mother, uh, ma'am, what, what, what does your husband do? And uh, the mo mother saying, he's a ditch digger. Uh, does he have a college education? No. Uh, that what, what do you do? I don't have a job. Uh, do you have a college education? No. Uh, why are you coming to America? Uh, because uh, it's better than where we left. And then what, do you have kids? Yes, we have a son. What is your hope for that uh, young man? Nothing much, just that he become the governor of New York. And that is the story of the United States uh, at its ideal, that people can come of all different backgrounds, of all different means, uh, but then make something of them in their lives. So when we talk about immigration, we have to understand that powerful undercurrent uh, and not just look at, well, if someone has means or someone has money or someone has degrees, it's all important. But look at how do we cultivate ultimately a nation uh, with that spirit of ambition, which ultimately is what propels uh, our success. Yeah, on that note, uh, entrepreneurship is all about ambition. So I guess, uh, you know, thank you for taking the time and uh, supporting, uh, you know, Thrive and Initiative. We'll come back to you with respect to how the various chapters within the United States of Thai can. Work with your well, I'm with very you. excited. Well, thank you, APK, for your leadership and Yogi for your, your vision. And to all of you at, at Thai, I think you're at the cutting edge of supporting a mission critical uh, aspect of the United States, promoting entrepreneurship, uh, promoting it across the nation, uh, helping us lead technologically. So it's a, a very, very important uh, uh, organization, and, and I'm very proud that its genesis was here in our district. And I look forward to working for many years with the with all of you. Yeah, that's great. And thank you all. Thank you all.